Hi everyone, my name is Ploy Perapokin and I'm going to be reading the beginning of a short story called Children of the Naripon Tree. We linked arms around the house, hung amulets on all three floors, duct taped every door back, lined our floor trimmings with protective thread from the temple, secured and fastened each lock on every window in all five bedrooms, joined our palms and pled all versions of Namo Tasa, O oh, exalted one, let us seek refuge in your light by our pillows. Within minutes of laying down, we crashed. Diamond stirred from under my limbs and riches expelled gentle snores lulling me to sleep. The stench of burnt pork woke us up. Coughing, I turned left to the source, caught shadows reaching over our windowsills and screamed. Moonlight haloed their pear-shaped silhouettes squished against the glass. Offensive heads growing out of fledgling bodies looked in. Their limbs butted unevenly in contorted angles, their faces black voids. Some wait for us to go over. My brothers joined in yelling. Our knees and elbows hit the hardwood floors first. We didn't stop hollering until our grandmother barged in. Light switch flipped. Calm. They can't come inside with everything locked. We slowly unclasped ourselves. Only the trees swayed outside now, dry leaves rustling in the breeze. Diamond stood up to help Ama straighten our sheets and fluff our covers, both muttering incantations to ward our visitors away. Diamond remained curled and peered over his knees. Are we really going to sleep here after that? I whispered. What's the worst they could do, come back? Diamond shot back, conveniently forgetting he was cowered between us a few minutes ago. Do you get excited knowing you're being watched? No one is coming back, Ama said. After tying monk-less strings on our window handles, she tottered over and pulled us in. You three, listen. Spirits cannot be banished. They must leave on their own accord, she said. We can either drag our feet through this or sail through one day at a time. We had barely unpacked the next day when soldiers from the U.S. Embassy dropped by. Flanked by two new haughty nose grunts, Colonel Harris asked to speak to our father again, replaying this exact scene from last month. We said what we said, we heard Ama tell her, come back on Monday. Doors closed, bolts clicked. Papa yelled for one of us to let them in, so we rock, paper, scissored whose turn it was, diamonds. Riches and I saluted as they sauntered by our winding stairs, waited until their footsteps disappeared, then clambered behind. The adults conferred in dulcet tones, huddled in the sitting room, aware that we were spying from opposite glass pocket doors. Diamond nudged his ear into the gap, reciting Papa's words like tragedy, no news and no clue, while Riches and I raked our brains of the past January, putty knifing spackle, knocking down closets, and mopping our hallways with Ama. Then Colonel Harris asked if she could speak to your children, and the doors flung open, knocking us back. Boys, take the gentleman into the kitchen, and Sapphire, you'll stay here this time, Papa said, reticent. Don't worry, I'll be checking in on all of you. Colonel Harris motioned for me to take a seat, and I noticed all of their teacups were untouched. I didn't blame them. Our white stucco walls covered in canvas and tarp ready for the painters gave the room a bleached sterile tint. No one inhaled comfortably here. We had hauled a few pieces of furniture inside to table our supplies, paintbrushes and buckets Colonel Harris had slid aside to set up a tape recorder. I waited out of respect until she sank into Papa's office chair, then sprung onto Mama's drop cloth settee. I promise everything you say here will be kept private. We're simply here to roll out that there was no foul play concerning Christopher Sandler's death, she said. I sank back more, wary of the reeling static and jiggled my legs, crinkling the paper shield beneath me. Colonel Harris's persistent didn't waver. Her skin was still as smooth and supple as the last time, like she'd never held onto a grudge her entire life. Your father tells me you were in his brother's home group. What was David's relationship like with Christopher? 
I told her that Dick Falangs rarely played with us, even though we shared the same classroom. Once, while waiting at our school's driveway, I had offered them both a ride back. We can stop for fishball noodles in front of our soy, I had said. Christopher perked up a little, but David hissed back, what will people say when they see us with our landlord's daughter? They hummed and hawed when I countered that no one knew they were renting from us anyway, just as Mrs. Sandler rolled up in her expensive car and barked at them to get in. She glowered at me, slits darkening, mumbling something about how her boys didn't eat dirt from the streets, as though egg noodles were sanitized differently in hotel buffets. Colonel Harris sucked her teeth. I wasn't sure if I said the right thing. That's all I know, I included. I don't want to talk anymore because I don't know anything else. It's bad enough that we had to clean up their mess and now we're tiptoeing around our own house. She affirmed again that this was protocol the embassy mandated for all of their ex-employees. I'm sorry we didn't follow up sooner. The whole school knows Christopher hung himself here because of his mother. Colonel Harris wilted. What else can you tell me about Mrs. Sandler then? Rumors of Christopher scrawling out the faces of women in school textbooks, David prostrating in front of our principal, begging to loiter after school past dinner time, and both of them trembling as they decorated their Mother's Day cards swirled in my mind. With a lump blocking my throat, I thought, why did we have to account for them? I know things must be hectic right now, but anything, even if you think it's unimportant, could be of help. Colonel Harris said. She placed her business card in my open palm, logo side up. The U.S. government's Blue Eagle eyeing me. Thank you.